greetings and buongiorno. I'm unable to make it over to Italy from Iowa in the United States for the presentation. That's really unfortunate. Florence is beautiful, but I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me nonetheless. Uh, my name is Peter Knudsen. I'm an eighth grade science teacher, and I've prepared a presentation for you that looks at my perspectives as to my students' reactions regarding an expanded uh, radioactivity and nuclear age unit that I do and some of their thoughts and feelings regarding the science and geopolitics therein. At the bottom of the screen you'll see a link to a Padlet and you can post any comments or questions about the presentation there. I'd love to hear from you. I'll try to have some work examples and lesson plans as well. Uh, a little bit about my middle school. It's a very large middle school, a very white middle school, not very diverse. Uh, we're from a town of about 60,000 right on the Mississippi River in the middle of the United States and we are very rural at the same time. In the months preceding the radioactivity unit we do go through what I like to call chemistry junior. It's a very elementary level chemistry course but we do hit all the basic uh, physical and chemical properties and changes, states of matter, basic reactions, gas laws, we also spend a good deal of time focusing on the structure of the atom itself, uh, how the nucleus is set up, uh, valence electrons, ions, and how they relate to bonding. Uh, we do go through isotopes and then get into molecular structure, and we even touch upon hydrocarbons and alcohol. Although our curriculum only requires a little bit of uh, radioactivity, I, I do expand it out to about a month-long unit. Um, I, I think the connection between the topics on the left to the topics on the right of your screen are very important for, for students to get because it really shows a deep connection between science and our world. To begin the unit, we do show visual models of fission and fusion and how the isotopes uh, relate to those processes, chain reactions. Uh, but when we get into radiation types and how binding energy works, I like to get the kids up and moving. A little uh, demonstration I do for alpha, beta, and gamma radiation is I have students actually get up and physically try to move about the room. The alpha particle is represented by four students, and they lock arms. And they, they can move through a wide gap between the desk rows, but they can't move through smaller ones. And one student represents the beta. He can move further throughout the classroom, but is stopped at the smaller gap. I use a meter stick to show the gamma ray uh, because that can move through quite a bit before finally getting stopped. Uh, binding energy, which, which comes largely into play for our, our fission discussions, is I have a student get up in the middle of the room and I pretty much find anything I can find and have them hold it in their arms. Just keep piling it on, piling it on, until an item or two falls off to the side and then I call attention that then that's alpha decay. Like the nucleus has gotten so big that it just can't quite hold all the, the items anymore and that one needs to fall away to kind of balance things out. Uh, to show fission, uh, I have a very willing participant come up and kind of bump into the other student and that makes all the items go everywhere, just like as in nuclear fission. This is one of two half-life labs that we do, and they yield some mathematical models and some lessons about large data sets. They have a simulation that, that decays at a certain rate. It's done randomly, so when they do one trial, it doesn't meet the half-life uh, hardly ever. But as they create more trials and we compile all classes worth of data, uh, that, that graph gets closer and closer to the theoretical expectation. The second half-life lab that we do involves pennies. The students shake them up in a box, and all the ones that come up heads are the decayed. Very similar to the first one, but in this case, the students actually physically plot their data points on the same graph. And we see, again, the more data we get, the closer we get to the theoretical expectation. This is a very important concept for middle school students to um, learn, is that the more data that you get, the more accurate the results are. In the unit, I teach students to utilize the ZAX notation that is formally used for um, describing elements with their isotopes. And I have them run through decay chains. And I do throw up a full chain at first, and the, and the kids are really overwhelmed. They're like, oh my gosh, I, no way I can do that. But when I break it down with the alpha particles and the beta particles, they find it's quite easy, and they 
very fluidly do it within a class period. Uh, for my honor students, we actually um, work through a few problems with E equals MC squared, and later in the year we actually look at the Joule as a unit more closely. But the kids are, are, are pretty excited to actually use the famous equation as it was intended, and this really gives them confidence. From here, the students move beyond the science and to how that science affected uh, the world in the, the 20th century. And I mean, they're given a brief background on the history of the radioactive discoveries. Uh, we do talk about the Manhattan Project during World War II, uh, the need for it, uh, the industrial efforts that went into it, uh, the mass of scientists in the desert trying to create this bomb. Um, the first major discussion point, however, comes with the Hiroshima-Nagasaki bombings. Uh, students are given the actual letter to Harry S. Truman that was written to urge him not to use it. And the students are asked to um, write a response to that, whether they agree or disagree, and, and that they defend their choice. Um, after which we actually divide up into groups in class and have a class-wide discussion. Now this discussion has gotten very heated in, in certain years with uh, yelling occurring at times, but that just shows that they're starting to become passionate about their ethics and, and the use of science uh, for the betterment of humanity and that not all decisions are easy. Students are shown the Trinity and Beyond movie, uh, which outlines the U.S. atmospheric testing program up till 1962 and you know there's a few reflective questions uh, um, that the students answer after the movie but this kind of leads into larger discussion about the morality of the Cold War use of nuclear testing um, you know they're given the background on deterrence with the Russians and whether it was a just enterprise to continue these tests that are bigger and and more destructive in the name of maintaining that deterrent force. Um, you know, they're also given some information regarding the adverse effect on local populations. Um, in the United States, the, the downwinders in Nevada and, uh, and the Marshallese that were displaced and, and sometimes exposed to that radioactive fallout. We do talk uh, uh, briefly about non-U.S. testing and how that also affected either um, local populations or indigenous um, peoples. Um, we, we do look at the U.S. Engineering Corps that um, went and cleaned up the Marshall Islands and how many of them are now facing major health problems because of their exposure to some of the daughter products and raw plutonium while the cleanup occurred. In addition to the geopolitics of the atomic age, we also touch upon how it infiltrates into popular culture and some of the propaganda pieces. Uh, we look at the United States civil defense films of the 1950s and 60s, uh, the old Bert the Turtle duck and cover, and you know the students do pick up on one hand it really perseverates that fear of the public about nuclear war, but at the same time kind of reassures them and it they pick up on that. Um, I also show some scenes from popular films that, that touched upon the concept of nuclear war. Uh, show them clips from Dr. Strangelove, War Games with Matthew Broderick, The Day After, even Rocky IV. And they really start to see, especially going into the 1980s, that public feeling of non-proliferation and the sheer absurdity of having the nuclear war. Um, from there, we do segue into the concept of mutually assured destruction and how if one person launches their missiles, everybody will launch their missiles, and everybody's done for. And they really feel it's a futile way to progress, given that, that humanity would be annihilated. This is a, a short little assignment I do with my students, and they are asked to interview a family member, um, something they remember about the Cold War. Uh, very common answers that I get is uh, they remember nuclear drills in elementary school, seeing it on TV and the movies, uh, Three Mile Island or Chernobyl accidents, and this has uh, helped to push um, oral history of these events forward for the students. This is the culminating assignment for the unit. Each student uh, picks a topic from a predetermined list 
um, could be anything from nuclear weapons to nuclear power. Um, they're asked to present their information in four different manners, one being a page write-up, a bit more traditional paper, uh, two posters where they can very dynamically present general information, but then also how that topic connects to society. And that's where I want them to get the most out of, is that connection to society. These are scientists who have made scientific discoveries and scientific experiments, but it permeated through many aspects of life in that second half of the 20th century. Uh, finally, the students are asked to write um, down a drawing or schematic uh, that is most appropriate to their topic. Um, anything from a fission reaction to the example here, which is how radiation affects the human body. These are hung in the hallway for display, and the kids are often quite proud of their work. Twice during 2016, North Korea provided fodder for my students to utilize their knowledge of nuclear processes. These were quite random occurrences, and we jumped on them right as they happened. Uh, the first one came in January of 2016 when North Korea conducted another test. Um, North Korea claimed that it was a hydrogen test. So I gave my students access to the seismic data um, surrounding the test and they took it and matched it up with other seismic data from other tests and it simply didn't match up for them. And they wrote up a class-wide document and we sent it out to a few agencies. And believe it or not, we heard back from all of them. Uh, the students were really excited that somebody um, like Clarence Bishop in the example on the screen there from the NNSA would, would take the time to read and evaluate their work and that their work was accurate. The second opportunity came when North Korea made some wild claims that they could hit Washington, D.C. with a missile and a nuke bigger than anything the Russians ever had. Um, we were actually in our physics unit at the time, so they were very familiar with uh, force and how to um, apply Newton's equations. And again, the, the math just didn't add up, and we sent it out to some of the same agencies and heard back again with some very uh, high compliments to the students and their work. This one even yielded a response from a former Secretary of Defense for the United States, William J. Perry, and we were covered a bit in the local media for that, but the students were, were absolutely floored uh, that they heard back from a person of that stature. Uh, these exercises really allowed the students to apply in real time their knowledge of science to a world event. In the many years that I've now done this unit, I've seen a pattern of growth in my students, in their ability to connect science to society and the world around them. Um, this is a, a great vehicle to show students that science does not exist in a lab and that it does reach out and can permeate amongst many parts of the world, including geopolitics and culture. And the nuclear age was really driven by scientists. It was a scientific discovery. And the connection between scientists doing these things and the way that our politicians and the world viewed and used these creations is very powerful for them. It's important that we have our students see beyond the textbook and see the, the ripple effect that scientific discoveries from um, scientists can have. And not all of them are going to be good. Uh, I also see an increase in my students' confidence when they get to do what they would consider complex science and that they can utilize something that Einstein himself created. Students are really kind of bewildered by the total interconnectedness, however, of the military science and politics of the 20th century. And I think it's important also that things like this connect with industry as well, that there has to be raw products that are turned into these materials that make these highly complex things. Even their iPhones of today, we, we touch upon that. Um, this gives them also the tools to look at contemporary issues such as North Korea, Iran, 
even Putin and Trump with their new arms race, um, and Fukushima, that they have the tools to, um, you know, scientifically analyze to a certain extent these events today. Thank you all for attending this session. I hope you found it informative and enjoyable. Uh, please visit the website at the bottom and leave me your thoughts and comments. I'd really value your feedback. Thank you and have a great conference.